Welcome to In Focus, brought to you live by the Government Information Service and the National Television Network. And it's a live discussion call in program, and we're going to be on air for the next 90 minutes. With me once more is my co host, Alyssa Joseph. Well, Alyssa certainly has been quite a, a busy period between our last program and the Tuesday seemed to come up by so quickly. Mm. And just yes, last week, we had the acting director of NEMO who was speaking to us about all the work being done for the preparations and the passage of then Tropical Storm Dorian. And Dorian has certainly been kept very much in the news. The Bahamas certainly took a pounding and we know that members of the eastern seaboard of the United States, particularly Florida, put on very much alert, but it's just moving a bit up north and we understand. So the Carolinas that, are yes, now under the watch. Chairman of CARICOM, yes. the Prime Minister of St. Michel, Honorable Alan Chastney, leading a delegation to the Bahamas today to look at some of the recovery efforts and what role CARICOM can play. So maybe a good time to get a lead off today on our program before okay. we go into our new segment to look at what the Prime Minister's visit will be like and what's actually going to happen in the Bahamas during that visit. Yes, Ryan, there's an official statement that has been released from the office of the Prime Minister. As you know, Honorable Alan Chastney is the chairman of the Caribbean community, CARICOM. But before I get into that, let us say good morning and thank you so much to the listeners on WVENT Radio 93.5 FM. Thank you so much for joining us. And our Prime Minister, the Honorable Alan Chastney, and who's also the Chairman of CARICOM, as you just heard me say there, today led a high-level delegation to the Bahamas, which has been ravaged by Hurricane Dorian over the past few days. The slow-moving hurricane brought strong winds, heavy rain, and a life-threatening storm surge to the Bahamas, flooding homes and entire villages with the death toll linked to the hurricane rising to as much as 20 we heard this morning. CARICOM and OECS member countries have pledged their support and Prime Minister Chastney will be accompanied to the Bahamas by the Barbados Prime Minister Honorable Mia Motley, Car the Caribbean Tourism Organization's Chairman and St. Lucia's Minister for Tourism Honorable Dominic Fede, the Secretary General of CARICOM, the Ambassador Owen LaRocque and the Executive Director of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, CDEMA, Mr. Ronald Jackson. And the CARICOM Chairman has been in regular contact with the Bahamas Prime Minister, Honorable Dr. Hubert Minnis, and in a statement released this week, Prime Minister Chastney says that the Caribbean is in full solidarity with the government and people of the Bahamas and stands ready to give whatever assistance is required to deal with the effects of this tragedy. Now, in advance of Hurricane Dorian, Sidema had already taken the lead to coordinate the regional response mechanism, and Sidema deployed two rapid needs assessment teams to the Bahamas. And the purpose of the visit is to continue discussions and see where CARICOM can provide more immediate support. So those rapid response teams have been on the ground and really getting a sense of what it is that the people of, of the two most uh, affected areas of the Bahamas, the Abaco Islands, as well as Grand Bahama. So the government of St. Lucia has pledged full support to the recovery efforts for the Bahamas. And CDEMA has informed that the immediate needs of the islands, water and water pumps. However, CDEMA has advised that monetary contributions would be easier and logical as procurement of needed items can be purchased at locations closer to the Bahamas. So the government of St. Lucia has thanked all the St. Lucians who have expressed interest in this humanitarian thrust and is encouraging everyone to make the cash contribution to the following accounts in the name of the government of St. Lucia. So at First National Bank, using the SWIFT code, L-U-0-B-O-B-L-C-L-C. -C. The account number there is 6002760. At RBTT, that account number is 10, pardon, that should be 18003000004 and at the Bank of Nova Scotia, the account there is 2002817. The Bank of St. Lucia, 
is 901-300-163. At First Caribbean International Bank, it's 1069-6217. We can leave that card up just for a little while longer so that our viewers can see what those account numbers are. Uh, you could also log on to the Government of Senusha website where you can get these account numbers as well. And for us here in Senusha, I think many people are saying thank you and being uh, knowing that Senusha could have very often been in the position that the Bahamas is right now. And Hurricane Dorian, as a tropical storm, proved to be so unpredictable because our information, um, when Dorian was making its way across from Barbados to St. Lucia, uh, that it would have landed here as a Category 1. But then Dorian decided, no. And as we know, the storms have a mind of their own. They do their own thing. And so many other factors, environment, come into play. And it remained as a tropical storm. And it just passed over us. And so um, saying thank you to the Lord uh, is, would not be unusual for us to do. However, our hearts are broken. Certainly my heart is broken seeing the damage that is caused there. But it is also a teaching moment. We cannot, cannot under uh, or over state the importance of always being in a state of preparedness and heeding the warnings. I personally saw news items from the Bahamas where Prime Minister Minnis went into the Abaco Islands, for example, and um, pleaded with people there to leave. But as with anything else, what some of, what some of the residents were saying is that well, we've been lucky, nothing has really ever happened, and, and so we're not leaving, we want to stay. And so people stayed. Some evacuated, but a lot of people stayed and lives lost and there are so many more who are missing at this time and it also breaks my heart to hear that the search and rescue that would be ending today and so let's just hope that everyone is accounted for once that operation is done at the end of today yes Lisa certainly a tragedy that really you know really breaks your heart, as you said. And just last week, while we were here, just thanking ourselves and thanking the Lord that we were spared the, the real force of the, it was a storm at the time, but we knew they had potential to really accelerate into a hurricane and being so unpredictable. No one, you know, could have actually pinpointed where would have been struck hardest and the potential for increased strength and damage was certainly there. And but you know, the discussion wasn't even for Dorian, so um, category f to get into a category five, but to be as strong as it was, wind stronger than what Maria carried. Just yes, imagine that. Yes, and it was fascinating to have heard some of the comments that yeah. were really negative in terms of, you know, persons being given false alarms and why were people forced to prepare for events like this. I, in 2019, it really was beyond it me. It boggles the mind yeah, that, uh, that we will have that yes, sort of mindset, that mindset given definitely. after what happened with Irma, what happened with Maria. Um, our new normal now in St. Lucia and the rest of the Caribbean is that storms like Irma, Maria, and now Dorian will happen every year, every hurricane season. That is what we're being told. But we need not be told that because we are experiencing it. Yes. And so we can no longer believe that, well, okay, there are only three storms that they've predicted it's going to be. Because now the new normal is a Category 5, and we're looking at 185 yes. power winds. This, I mean, it, it is, you can't even grasp the magnitude of what that is. And, and I don't want to ever have to experience it. But I know that perhaps it's inevitable because of what the trend is in the region. And so we have to completely shift the way we think, the way we approach disaster preparedness. Um, we need to have plans in our homes that ought talk about it year round. Because we know that even outside of the designated uh, hurricane season, we get storms yes, as well. Do. 
we and get rain events. Yes, what was incredible too was bearing in mind the topography of the major islands of the Bahamas and to see that they were virtually re reduced to, to marinas, yes. basically. Yes. And this morning, I think that the account for a long time had been seven, but it had been up to 20 this it's morning. It's now 20. That's, that's not finalized, of course, it's certainly a lot of searching will be going on. You, you, you said that it would be called off soon. But it's going to be, you know, a long time in coming before you actually get the, the final and true picture of the devastation really brought on the Bahamas. So we are hoping that things will improve and not be the worst. And did you see those pictures of the airport? There's certainly the, the terminal was certainly like a, a, a fall coop that was invaded. He wrecked, completely wrecked. And that is indicative of what the entire area looks like. That, so just reduced to nothing, rubble. And so we, we can't, we can try to, to, where we talk about resilience, we talk about building with res, um, resilience in mind, uh, but we can't necessarily prevent that sort of damage from happening. That is beyond our scope. That's not within our control, but we can mitigate and we can do things to keep ourselves safe. And the most important thing is to always heed the warnings. I'm not trained, I'm not a trained person in meteorology, nor are you, but we have the individuals who can tell us, and let's track it together with them. Let's not try to pretend that we know more than them and dismiss what the, the, the information is. Let's not do that. I think over the years we've had our event, we've had Debbie, um, you know, going through the Christmas Eve trough, we had Thomas, and that's just really on a very small scale of what that damage can be. I know Hurricane Allen, um, which I don't really have any memory of, uh, a lot of people I hear, I older do. people talk about that. And so they would have experienced uh, Allen, and it is in the record books as one of the most um, damaging, dangerous uh, hurricanes. So we need not go back into that era and you know get into complacency and all of this you know, we we need to take um our disaster preparedness more seriously yes listen uh, just before we go into other uh, other news items in the news segment just reminding our viewers and our listeners that we're very much in the hurricane season we still need to mm -hmm. stay on guard and you know as lisa said place a lot of confidence in those who guide us it's an act of nature but again luckily we have persons who are trained in forecasting and we have improved technology who can track these systems. So let's place some sort of confidence in the ability to at least warn us that these um, systems are approaching, whatever natural disaster that may be coming our way, you know, some are more difficult to predict. It's an act As of Dorian nature. Was yes, it's an act of nature. With all of the computer models. Yes. <laughs> it's an act of nature that we do not really have much control over, but we have some means of getting some sort of warning as we look to other items in the news today on In Focus. The Department of the Public Service is addressing one of the most serious problems plaguing the work environment. The department is aiming to curb internal complications that are negatively affecting the human resource. More in this report from Miguel Morissette. In recent times, public and private sectors have been faced with the issue of poor indoor air quality and mold. It is said that exposure to poor indoor air quality can cause short-term eye, nose and throat irritation, as well as headaches, dizziness and fatigue. The government of St. Lucia is currently faced with the constant challenge of relocating staff, conducting deep cleaning and in some cases abandoning building structures altogether. Communication personnel in the Department of the Public Service spoke with facilities management officer Lyndon Barry Georges in order to better understand the situation. I don't think that the poor air quality is directly the cause of the mold, but it can lead to creating an environment for the mold to thrive. Um, a lot of times what has been done is that we move into existing buildings. These existing buildings are not newly built and if, if they are newly built which means whether or not the construction was to standard. If the air conditioning system which is supposed to create that artificial environment within the building is not designed properly, then you're additionally creating a situation where the environment will allow for the mold to thrive in it. Um, 
also we need to make sure on our end that standards are being followed when we're constructing if you do not construct correctly insulate your walls if you need to um, then what you have is it may not happen in the early stages but as the building gets older then you find that um, the conditions it does not have that resistance to sustain the conditions that you you need to maintain on the inside so standards are the are, are key to everything that we do um, typically Graham Lucy building before we did our medial works um, you had a lot of surface cracks so you had areas where rains water comes in and the water is being stored inside that wall so you have a lot of condensation then you have on the afternoon the sun hits it so what does the sun do it dries from the outside and it brings everything on the inside what does the AC do on the inside of the space it dries and it brings everything here they stop at the center and that's where you have condensation forming and you have that moisture is a is favorable for mold to start growing from inside here right so what 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 happened is treating the system from the source mold always has a source especially when it relates to the to a building that was one of the sources of the mold he said mold can be resolved if officers adhere to precautionary measures if you're transferring from one ministry to into a from an old building into a, a, a new location one has to make sure that certain protocols are followed the cleaning of your books thoroughly properly and bringing it into the space properly quarantined into the new space to make sure that you don't transfer the bacteria into the new space it's also a situation of what do we maintain how do we our housekeeping on the inside of the space because a lot of persons may think that um, the the conditions are only created by the mechanical equipment it's not my books on my desk the janitorial services within the building how frequently do we do um, a deep cleaning of the space to make sure that dust particles are not kept because you have dust particles the janitors come they clean if they do not clean pro properly what do you have if the AC system does not provide that assurance that you need that the air is balanced then you have a condition on the in this inside that's favorable for the dust particles to get attached to the water droplets in the air you have mold right now most times what happens is that you don't detect it until someone says I'm feeling sick I'm not feeling too well and then it happens too late so that's why we we're trying our best on the public service ends to advise persons on the way forward how to deal with the situation because most times we may be slightly the cause of it over time poor air quality can trigger the effects of asthma and constant exposure can lead to respiratory disease cardiovascular disease or even cancer Permanent Secretary in the Department of the Public Service, Peggy Ann Sudat, reported that the government is seeking creative and new interventions to deal with this problem. We as a public service have implemented a number of measures. Among them would be making arrangements for, the med for medical consultations for staff, medical consultations and testing for staff um, to ensure that they are, not imp they are not impacted negatively by the issues in the workplace. Um, additionally, in for the longer term solution, we have identified some areas and we have brought in some consultants or, or, or experts to do a more in-depth analysis so that we can find out exactly what is happening and what exactly is causing the problems to come up with a longer term solution for dealing with them. The Assistant Permanent Secretary in the Department of the Public Service, Augusta Duval Tuse, is calling on all public servants to assist in alleviating the aforementioned problem. Over the last few years, we've had a prevalence of occupational health and safety issues affecting many of our government agencies. In order to mitigate these issues, we have instituted a preventative maintenance regime. That regime includes biannual deep cleaning of the office space, the quarterly servicing of the air conditioned units, and proper storage of household chemicals. In addition to these measures, we encourage officers to take personal responsibility of their office space. We encourage officers who have offices to occasionally open your windows so that fresh air can come in to better ventilate the office space. In addition, we are making a very special appeal for officers who eat at the desk. Please, please officers do not leave leftover food in your desk 
as this practice creates the environment for the development of mold. The government of St. Lucia continues to work tirelessly as it seeks to eliminate the problem. From the communications unit in the Department of the Public Service, Miguel Morissette reporting. That's the Ocean Arts and Craft one show at Carifesta just finished, Carifesta 14, which is held in Trinidad and Tobago. The Senusians generated a lot of interest and sales. We hear in this report, uh, there is a wide range of Senusian creativity that Carifesta was just eager to participate in. The St. Lucian Arts and Craft Expo at Carifesta 14 in Trinidad and Tobago has been making an impact on regional visitors from day one. Raphael Descartes is representing Membet. So far it's been very good. My, I was setting up and my first customer came. She bought the, the first bag, I took pictures and all. Interest has been high for Lisa Barton Volney of the zip code and the clothesline. Oh, well, it has been great because our items are different. Nobody expected to see jewelry out of zippers. Yes, so the, the response from persons has been great. It's very encouraging. For Terrell Nicholas, the strategy was to use national flags to appeal to a diverse Caribbean audience. The islands participating in Carifesta, I did spoon necklaces with their flags in there. So that has been a big hit. I mean, I made quite a few sales for the morning just for the fact that the, the flag was in the spoon, you know, one man bought six of them. Jennifer St. Louis of Poetry Kisses showcased products made from material that is uniquely St. Lucian. We use a lot of local products. We use shells and stones, um, uh, seeds, our local seeds as well, and a lot of natural materials, especially like hemp cord for people with sensitive skin. And so we're always mindful of these things, but I try my best to capture the essence of the island and of the Caribbean around. Shirley Ann Edward of Shirley's Creations, a veteran of regional exhibitions, displayed her uniquely created St. Lucian themed Christmas decorations. But I can use something very, very new, which are the, the balls and cinnamon and local products, which is St. Lucia Creole Christmas. The focus on St. Lucian online entrepreneur Darian Louis was to bring Caribbean creativity onto one single online platform through Shop the Caribbean. Carifesta provided the perfect setting. I'm here to showcase our wonderful products from across the region, especially my home island of St. Lucia, from craft to sulfur soaps to virgin coconut oil. Because at Shop the Caribbean, we believe that we have some really amazing products across the Caribbean region, but there needs to be a platform whereby collective shopping can be done, consolidation can be done. Darian notes that one of the items on sale for Shop the Caribbean has been driven by visitors to the island. And one of our best products and best movers on the site is the sulfur mud soap, which depicts the sulfur mud from the volcano, which visitors sought after they come to St. Lucia for. But when they return home, they want that mud feeling and that exfoliating feeling they cannot get. So we've translated this into a mud soap, and it has been one of our best movers online since then. The St. Lucian artists at Carifesta are hoping that with days left, there will be a greater interest and more demand for authentic St. Lucian creativity. They are also learning that there is real competition out there. From the Government Information Service, I am Rojvaro Lawrence reporting from Carifesta 14 in Trinidad and Tobago. The Department of Health and Wellness is continuing to make preparations for the smooth transitioning from the Victoria Hospital to the new Owen King EU Hospital. Through a series of discussions, here's Fernel Neptune. A delegation from the University Hospital of Martinique recently paid a visit to the Owen King EU Hospital to provide feedback and technical expertise on the transition to the Millennium Heights Medical Complex. Permanent Secretary in the Department of Health and Wellness, Felix St. Hill, says he is very pleased with the collaboration with the team from Martinique given the experience from a recent transition to a new hospital. The support is a um, uh in practically all facets of the transition in, 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 in medical and clinical, you know, organizational, technological. So the team that just arrived in St. Lucia that have been working with us for the past two days, they've been looking at our electrical systems, our water systems, our medical gas systems, you know, our policy with regard to maintenance, even some of our, our organizational issues, 
like I mentioned, you know, we probably share quite similar cultural experiences. So the change management process, you know, they've been advising us because the important thing is that Matnik itself just went through a transition in themselves to the University Hospital of Matnik where they had some enlargement, you know, of their own facilities and their own services. Director of Cooperation at the University Hospital of Martinique, Christian Bourgeois, says it is important that they strengthen the medical cooperation with St. Lucia. Uh, we, uh, we discovered a wonderful and exciting uh, building. This OK EU is really a, a very, very interesting building. Um, we, we discover also a very engaged team, um, people ready for the change. This visit was a very um, good point because uh, we can see that uh, uh, all the comprehensive plans have been prepared, but there are some very specific issues, technical issues to address uh, in order to secure all the plans. So we, are, we, uh, we leave uh, St. Lucia in uh, the hope that we, they will uh, succeed and we can uh, help uh, succeed this challenge. The Department of Health and Wellness wants to assure the general public that transitioning plans for the new hospital are progressing smoothly and that they are committed to providing quality health care services. Reporting from the Communications Unit of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, I am Fennel Neptune. Well, listen, we've had some very interesting stories in our new segment, the Department of the Public Service, looking to make the workplace a much more conducive for public servants. Uh, the St. Lucia's Art and Craft on the spread at Cardi Festa 14 in Tree and Tobago that just ended. And also, as we just heard, Department of Health okay, and Wellness yeah. looking to get the transition going to the new hospital, the Owen King EU Hospital. And I know a lot of people looking forward to the completion of the transition period and so that you could say hello to the hospital as it opens. We've heard from the Prime Minister that the hospital will be opening in October, and so I know that there's a lot of excitement about that. Um, what I'm very, very excited about is St. Lucia's participation, Carifesto 14. I'm so happy that our artisans were able to have been part of that journey. And, you know, going off into that uh, space where you have so many people from the Caribbean descending, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, as we know, it's, it's really a hub of creativity. Um, and to have had St. Lucians have an absolute breakthrough there is a, a big, um, it, 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 it is a, a sort of um, nod that we have what it takes. And all we need to do is to really pay attention to what it is that our craft is, what the dreams are, nurture that. And, uh, t and we can make it anywhere. So I'm happy that those who went down got the response that they did. And most importantly, the business aspect, making the money. Yes, the same yeah. say I really feel privileged to have had the opportunity to ac actually experience what CAIFES was about. And you use one of the buzzwords mm -hmm. of CAIFES, in my own opinion, that of creativity and also culture of the entire Caribbean. It, it really brings it out and to really experience the different cultures based on what is portrayed by the various islands, especially one on the, the island night, and as you said, the, the, the craft and the creativity of the, the different islands, how some are common, some are varied, some are unique and peculiar yes. to the individual islands. So it's really a wonderful experience and something that I'm sure whenever there's also in a, in a country, the, the local inhabitants certainly enjoy coming out and at, actually witnessing what goes on. So while we are all the same in the Caribbean, people like to say that, I, we are all different and there are unique nests that we can really play off and, and be able to carve a niche for ourselves. All right, we want to take a break here. When we come back, we will be having our guests with us, to very topical issues. We'll be having Dr. Sharon Belmar george and Monty Alexander from the Department of Health and Wellness. We'll be discussing smart facilities and, of course, the visit of that U.S. naval ship, the Comfort. So stay with us. We'll be back right after this.
bon la mer, c'est un bon place pour nous un bon temps. Mais c'est faux qu'on ait si un tsunami. Sous bon la mer, qu'on sente une terre qui a tremblé en pile. Baissé, couvert pas, et espéré tremblant de terre de bout, et couvert de mouté pour vous. Sous bon la mer, qui a witché l'air, qui a quitté l'ancien la vitement. Couvert de mouté pour vous. Sous le temps, la mer, qui a fait un tout le désordre. Couvert de mouté pour vous. Si vous avez n'importe quel signe, vous pouvez nous faire plus haut pour qu'on joue le monde. Et bien, troisième étage en caille. Et espérer les autorités annoncer que ça descend. Coué, 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 nous faire plus haut. Apprendre les signes de tsunami. La pépane est assez temps pour annoncer un tsunami qui a approché. C'est une commission par le groupe Management des Arts bien fort et classe Management des Arts en Saint-Lucie. Et financée par l'Agence pour le développement international Amérique, Bureau Assistance des Arts de l'autre pays. If you are in receipt of an abnormally high bill, it is highly possible that you have a leak. That leak may not always be visible. Before you contact Wasco, conduct a do-it-yourself test. 1. Record your meter reading. 2. Do not use water for 30 minutes to 1 hour. 3. Take another meter reading. If the reading changes, you have a leak. Contact a plumber to identify and fix the leak at the earliest. A message brought to you by the Water and Sewage Company Incorporated, Wasco. Préparation et preneur nous qu'à chaîne manger mérité en chaque proportion, particulièrement après un désastre. Millions de conseils qui peuvent empêcher de joindre maladie. Faites attention à l'occasion acheter manger. Examinez bien pour voir si dommage et gardez pour date où mérité pas servi encore. L'occasion acheter viande à la main bouchée, gardez pour stomp bureau libérement. En ministre santé, qui peut mouche ou qui, viande salade examinée et insatisfait pour vendre. Pas de viande, poisson, viande poule et bien l'autre manger qui mérite de rester à souffrir pour plus qu'il. 4 ml de rond et bien au machin. Lavez la main bien et puis savon avec l'eau tiède avant et 10 ans au cas entamé viande qui peut être tuite. Servez mon sur planche avec l'autre bagaille à part pour couper viande qui pas tuite. Mettez l'estomac manger tuite en fridge la même après vous servez et pas de les pour plus qu'il dé pour 3 jours. Et les ou qu'à vivre chauffer, fait à siwe et chaud en pile. Changez, mangez propre car empêcher maladie. Ouais, pour caution. Si vous voulez plus d'informations, cliquez bio information santé à numéro 468 secteur 49. Thanks for keeping the focus. We are back live on air in the studios of the Government Information Service and National Television Network. And you're also on radio live on WVENTS 93.5 FM. And as Issa just told you, before we went to the break, we'll be having our in-studio guests who so joined us. And you will also get the opportunity to place your calls. You can also send us your questions on our social platforms. And we're certainly hoping that you'll be able to participate at the end of the program. So, Lisa, once more, you're going to be looking at your guests. We'll make a formal invitation right now and certainly uh, give them the, the sort of welcome that they need as we stay in focus today. Can I welcome with an apology? Mm. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know what I'm thinking, still in the arts, right? So, Monty Alexander, hmm, love him. But uh, Monty Emmanuel, engineer in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Pardon for the slip up in the name. Yes. Do you get that often? Do yes. people? Yes? yes. Okay. So I'm not too much out of stride, right? No. Um, <laughs> so, and Dr. Sharon Belma George, medical officer of health within that ministry. Thank you so much for making the time. I know it must be very busy, especially for you, Dr. George, because uh, people are supposed to be making direct contact with you for getting onto the ship for surgery, or physicians who want to get on there, and I'm sure you're coordinating everything, but we'll talk about that in just a while. We want to sort of go back to where we began, um, resilience, uh, mitigation, preparing ourselves for um, eventualities that we really have no control over. And in St. Lucia, St. Lucia is part of a regional program um, which is sponsored by the British government, um, by the United Kingdom's Department for International Development, DFID, uh, and that is Smart Health Care Facilities. 
let's start there. Smart, what is smart about them? Okay. Um, smart healthcare facilities is a concept of safe and green. Um, the concept was introduced in 2013 and then we brought about a project in 2015. It's all part of growing resilience in the healthcare service. Many issues have surfaced throughout the years in healthcare that we figured it's about time that we get a concept and ensure that the facilities function during and after a storm or hurricane or an event. Because disaster is not only hurricane, but we tend to focus on hurricane, but it's actually any disaster event. So the concept is a safe concept, meaning that you have a structure that is resilient to disaster. And the green concept is very environmentally friendly. You trying to lower your carbon footprint within the facilities in terms of getting rid of mercury and keeping the facilities greener in terms of lighting and solar panels, reducing that, that consumption to bring the facilities to a, a level of savings, energy savings and any other savings within the, the sector. So that is the, the actual concept of SMART. So the facilities, I mean, it's, in, in the beginning when we started the project, it took a little while because we had to get a lot of baselines for the project because solution now, we had to take um, readings of all our electricity supplies. We had to go and train pe persons to go and do structural assessments of all the facilities. So we've assessed all the health centers on the island. We know the current condition. So we know the state of all the facilities on the island. So from that, we, we decided with the project that we're going to take a systems approach and start repairing our health centers to a level of SMART. SMART has now given themselves an A70 where A is safe and 70 is the level of greenness of your facility. So once you, reach, once you get that level of A70, you're now a SMART facility. I mean, it's in right now, St. Vincent has a SMART facility, um, Grenada, so we, we, we're now on board with that project. So we've already done all the baseline work for the, for the project. So earlier last year, we, mo we moved into the construction aspect of it. We, have now ha we will now have 12 facilities under construction. We've completed six, and the other six is currently ongoing. We want to complete those six facilities by the end of the year. So and the that's doable. Yes, it is doable because right now we have contractors on the ground actually working. So we've already completed six and the other six right now should be completed within the end of the year. Now when you talk about having done the assessment, what did these assessments tell you about where the facilities were at and what, what were some of the more pressing things you needed that needed to be done in order to make it resilient first? And then we can go into uh, green. Okay. Um, when we assess the facilities, they were basically at a C score for safety and at 35% uh, for greenness. So which means like we will, let's start with the, the green first. I mean, we had no energy efficient fixtures, faucets, LEDs, no solar lighting or generators were lacking for the smaller facilities. I mean, for the history of, uh, we, we never focused that much on green. So it was, our scores were very low with most of the other Caribbean islands because our focus was never such on green. Structurally, the most of our buildings scored a C because small, small elements were missing in terms of strapping roof to rafters and those little elements for safety. Uh, we made changes in terms of strengthening some elements in the building because some of our facilities are very old. Because remember, those health facilities have been on island to me from the time I know myself with all of these facilities. So you find that there were little structural issues that would reduce your score. So in the in the project, is the Zazi elements we do focus on. Uh, maybe changing some partitions that were old and putting concrete partitions to strengthen the rigidity of the building. These little elements that you have to look at the, the facilities, change some roofing, strap, like say, strap them down, ensure that, that you have that element of safety. Or oh, we change some of the windows from normal ho um, home windows to hurricane resistant windows. So these are the elements that we worked with to ensure that we have that level of safety. And then for the green, now that we do it, we, we, have, we now have um, energy efficient um, lighting, LED lighting throughout the facilities. We have um, low flush toilets, um, we have generators, we have um, solar power for V4. So we, all these elements came in to raise our, our carbon, um, lower carbon footprint, sorry. Also, uh, an aspect of the project also dealt with 
contingency where we went into the facilities that we were under construction, took the staff, and we had a, a like basically a workshop, and we focused on energy consumption because even if you have an LED light and the light stays on whole night, you're still not saving any energy. So we had to have we tried to change the behavior of the staff. So we sat them down. We had workshops. We took the ancillary staff also because they were the ones responsible for putting off the lights, ensuring that the toilets are clean. So we had to focus on them to make sure when you live in the building, put off all the lights, turn off the computers. Because those things you don't think about. But people think of it like, you know, it's government, it's not mine, so I leave the building, I'm not worried yes, about it. But latitudes. Yeah, yes. so the energy is still being consumed. So even if I give you an energy efficient AC, but you leave the room, nobody's in the room, the AC is blowing all day, the bill is still being generated. So that's one of the aspects we took very seriously. We had a, an entire workshop with all our staff. We tried to change that behavior. Also, as part of disaster, we also did disaster planning. We took everybody. We set disaster plans for all our facilities that were under construction. We ensured that there was a proper disaster plan coming out of the Ministry of Health master plan. So all facilities are aware of the disaster plan. Who do you call during a disaster? What your roles and functions are? Your chats on the wall? All these things were put into place. So if there's a disaster in one of the facilities, you know who to call. We know how the protocol is going to go. We, we did some minor drills. Fire service came in. So it's not just about the safety of the building or the greenness. We also brought in the element of a disaster. So if we have a disaster, you know where to react. You know where your triage might be. You know where, how you're going to cope with that, that, that fire or that mass casualty. So we had some events to work through. So that is not just about green or structure, it's also about the, the, the personal aspect, the functional aspect of the project. So we also did that to ensure that people just not aware of that, oh, we have a green building or, oh, it's safe. But then you, in the time of action, you need to know what to do. What to so do. we also ensure that it was part of the project. So most of the nurses in those facilities are aware of the disaster plan, the reaction plan, who do you call if there's a storm. And even during this one, it worked rather well. Everybody were able to to call in and say, hey, we, this happened, that happened, we know what to do. So, you know, I mean, luckily nothing happened to us, but everybody was prepared better than before. Mm -hmm. Usually our EOCs take a little longer to set up, but this time everybody knew their roles, it was quicker, it was easier. So that's what we're trying to maintain. I mean, looking forward, we want to do all the facilities, especially the PHC facilities, the primary healthcare facilities. So we were looking at to get all of, all of them to that same level. So the project has just started with those 12, and we're looking to move forward with all the rest of the facilities. On we the have island. a total of 35? 34. 34. 34. Yeah. In all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to find out, I know you're speaking basically from an engineering standpoint in terms of you know, looking at your resilience and your, your greening. But I just wonder if part of the plan was also to look at the, the service that you're going to be providing, and probably in that area would have been increased rooms, um, stations for doctors, additional staff, stuff like that. Was that taken into account or was just basically the well, resilience? Well, no. under, un under the SMART project, it was not taken into account. Okay. The SMART project allows you to improve your current infrastructure. But we have another project coming on stream okay. very soon um, from the OECS that will allow that. Uh, we're now looking at putting out terms of reference for us to increase our services, our SOPs, find out what is, what is going on within the, the, the ministry, or what we're going to provide, and then we're looking, we, under that project, we'll be looking at expansion of services. Currently, we were just looking at taking our stock and bringing it to a certain level before you expand. Because expansion costs money, and the donors mm -hmm. were figuring out to give you an expansion, you might end up with a 40-room a, a, a facility, and then they don't want the money to go into that kind of, of expense. So they want to know, this is your facility, how do we get it better? So the Ministry of Health now will come in on the other end and decide, okay, now that we have a good facility, how do we improve it to meet the services we want to offer? Yeah. So that is kind of the approach we took with that aid because they were not allowing any expansion of the footprint. Yes. I'd ask that because I'm sure there are persons who will be viewing this program and would have their own experiences visiting health centers and would like to reduce on the way the number of doctors that are yeah. available and the services that are being provided. So just looking at that, that aspect. Well, we, we're going to that direction. The, the second phase of, of SMART from the ministry standpoint would be looking at the, the, the service provided and how do we expand the services and where do we go from there. So it, it, we are aware of that and then it is part of the, it is the next phase into the SMART. For now, we're just bringing our stock to a level of satisfaction. So we know we're safe, we're resilient, and then we're reducing on our 
power bills, our water bills. So that is our focus for mm -hmm. now. Maybe I think into the next year we'll go more into expansions and this because this project ends December for us. So then from January, new financial year, we'll look into the other aspect of the program. Can mm -hmm. you give us an idea of the facilities that have already been completed? Okay, the facilities that have already been completed, we've completed Lafag, Saltibus, Morgouge, Bexon, um, Deriso, Bellevue, and Monrepo. Those are the six that are completed. The current six that are under construction is Marshy, Entripo, Tiroche Castries, Library. Mm -hmm. Let me see, Library. Oh, Saltibus are the six that are, uh, are under construction currently. So, do we know what they, for those that have been completed, how the communities, how have they received the new facilities? Well, okay, we did a, we did a KPA before um, to assess both internally and externally to find out what the views of the persons in the community and the public health centers were always part of the baseline. Um, we have not gone back into the community as yet because the, pro the most of the facilities were just completed within the last month. But the next step of that is to do another KPA to find out what is the reaction to the facility. But in, in, in the beginning, people were complaints were like they were extra hot, the seating, they were outside in the rain. So we, we took all this into consideration when we were doing the small designs and small changes to the facility. So now that we've just completed, I think Bex saw and the rest were completed two weeks ago. So the next thing is to go back and get reaction. So we, we want a month so that they can actually go into the facility and use it and see, okay, what is your reaction? So on the clinic, they will go back in and say, okay, are you more comfortable? What do you find in the new facility? Mm -hmm. So we have to set that, well, the baseline again, compare our baseline to our target and see what we get. So that's where we're at. Well, thank you, Monty Manu. We're going to take another break on our program, and he's actually an engineer in the Ministry of Health and Wellness. We'll be back on In Focus. What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth. All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too. We consume and we don't spare a thought for the damage that they'll do. The that no, they do. think about the children. Think about the children. How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution. Use organic and join. Excessive agrochemical use, additives, and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy, and consume organic. A message from Rise St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The good food revolution.
Thanks for staying with us live in focus and we're also reminding you we're coming from the studios of the government information service and the national television network we're also live on wvent radio 93.5 and 94.7 fm lisa we've got our other guests in studio dr sharon belma george and we've got some questions for her as well yes uh we'll be talking about the comfort comfort <laughs> the u.s naval ship in a while i just wanted to throw one other question to uh monty w under the smart program are we looking at equipment as well for these health facilities or mm, that doesn't form part no, of the part form, of the program it doesn't form part of smarter the program. equipment greener equipment <laughs> no but no it doesn't form part of the program in terms of currently implemented in this program but part of the new program will be looking into the equipment that we have the only equipment that we looked at was like mercury, anything with mercury, anything that was against the environment. But it did not go into replacing equipment. It's just a matter of removing. So then it's up, it will be upon the ministry to replace. So that is another reason why we're looking at the phase two to start new equipment, more energy efficient equipment, as all that is part of the program. Okay. Just to remind you that your questions, you can send them in for us. At, and we have the telephone number that's four six eight two one six two so when that gets on screen you could call in with your questions and you could also send it to our facebook page we will post a question to the guest for you uh dr sharon belmar george the u.s naval ship comfort yes. to be in saint Lucia for i know it's going to come perhaps a day or two before but yes. we'll be serving saint Lucians from the 23rd of september to the October 2nd. Uh, so it's, I know a lot has been said already about the, the ship, why it's come in and so forth. We don't necessarily want to go all in mm -hmm. and out, mm -hmm. but except to say um, that the US comfort is coming because? Well, the main, the primary purpose of the, the it's a humanitarian mission and it's to provide humanitarian support and assistance to partner nations. Um, this strategy is, is strengthening the cooperation, the partnership within the region through the U.S. Caribbean 2020 strategy. Um, this was enacted since 2016, and I mean, health is just one of the pillars within the strategy. It also includes education, security, energy, diplomacy, and prosperity. So it's really, the mission is really to strengthen our cooperation with the U.S. Um, within the region, and it's not new. From 2007, the Comfort Humanitarian Mission has been serving the region, and this is going to be their the seventh deployment. They started from the 15th of June, and they will end on the 15th of November um, this year. We are just very fortunate to be one of the countries. Because um, it has never been here before, despite... I'm not aware of it being here before. I know it's been to Jamaica and a lot of the other um, Caribbean countries, but this year, um, St. Lucia will be in, Grenada, Haiti, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, St. Kitts. So some of the other islands are quite happy as well to be a part of, of this humanitarian mission um, coming here. The ship gets here on the 23rd of September and leaves on the 2nd of October. There'll be a two-day um, setup period. So services will be available from the 25th of September up to the 30th of September. So about six days of providing both services in terms of within our walk-in clinics and also for surgical care on board the ship. And those walk-in clinics at the OKEU as right. well as the Castries Comprehensive Secondary we, School. The OKEU is confirmed, but we've not confirmed the Castries Comprehensive because we have some concerns in terms of the logistics and the traffic with there. So we're looking at another site. By the end of the month, we will be able to, before the end of the month, sorry, we'll be able to confirm our second site for the walk-in clinic. And I know many persons have concerns because when we met with the team from the, the mission, the naval team, and they said that we could set up two clinics, we first said, okay, one in the north, one in the south, because we figured we need to make it accessible for everybody. Yes. But because the ship they're coming in on the 23rd. They have a two-day setup um, period, and they're coming in with a lot of heavy equipment. For example, dentistry is one of those services that they'll be providing. They're coming in with 17 dental chairs, and if you know the size of a dental chair and the setup of dental equipment, so they indicated to us 
that the clinic must be a maximum of 40 minutes from as, staff. as much as we wanted a clinic there, they were not able. It would increase the setup time and it would mean less days to set up. So what we need to ensure is in place is a transportation system for persons around the island because we want to ensure that everybody who needs care can take advantage and access the service um, of those of those um, walk-in clinics because a wide range of services will be available there as well to the public. So when you say a transportation system for the public, is that to say that the ministry is making sp specific provisions to get um, people to the clinic? No, we are not making provisions to get persons to, but we are hoping that different communities and different community groups and also persons with families that live down the coast and would like to ensure that your grandparents or your relatives get, you ensure that there's a transportation system to get them there since we're not able to set up a clinic um, in the south of the island. And based on the number of professionals that will be there, they will be able to see a large number of patients at the clinic. They've indicated clinics start from 8 to 4 every day for the six days. And they've indicated that they could see a total of 500 persons per day per clinic. And so it's so, so because it, people say 500 people in a, day, yes. in a day, that's a lot. So, but yes. the team is also very large. The so team is, is large. Is it a thousand? No, it's about 200 um, health professionals from physicians to nurses to doctors to physiotherapists. So the team is about 200 persons um, coming down. So they will be able to see um, quite a few persons per day within the clinics. Now, with the, the services being, a lot of people have questions about what it is that they can get um, seen for, mm -hmm. and also their questions about what exactly when you talk about surgery, operation surgery. So let's just clear, clarify some of those okay. areas. The services, first of all, let's deal first with what people can walk in mm -hmm. for. So yeah, I just want to wake up and go. Yes. Yes. The two big clinics that we'll be having in the vicinity of Castries and the north of the island, these are the walk-in clinics between 8 a.m. from the 25th of September to the 30th, from 8 to 4, where persons can just come in. Those clinics will be, provided, will be providing internal medicine, that is persons who are hypertensive, diabetic, pediatrics, that is for children. There'll be pediatricians there to see children with ailments, general medicine, persons who just want to come in and get a checkup or concerned about something and want to get a second review can come in. Um, dental services, cleaning, dental work, they're going to be providing a wide range of dental services to us. Um, Does that include surgeries? A lot of people ask that as um, well if they need some form of dental surgery. Would some levels be will, be, will be provided. They'll review and see who needs what to make such a decision. So. So yes, there'll be a wide range of, like I said, they'll be coming down with 17 dental chairs. I don't think we have 17 in <laughs> our primary <laughs> care facilities. Um, optometry and eye care, they'll be reviewing for persons who need to get their eyeglasses replaced or get new ones or get it reviewed. They will be doing that and providing those eyeglasses free of charge as well to, to the public. Some people um, want to know, just the uh, generic forms Fancy well, classes. they're coming from the U.S. It's a wide range um, will be available um, to you. So I think this is a good opportunity for persons who need to get their eyes checked. Um, within our primary care public health services, we don't provide um, eyeglasses. And we know it's expensive. We know there are persons who need it. They need to get their exchange and they can't afford it. So we think that it is really an opportunity for persons to come in and, and get that done. They'll also be providing physiotherapy and reviews because they'll be there. There's a, an orthopedic specialist there as well. So persons who need physiotherapy done, there'll be a physiotherapist on, on board as well. Um, women's health, dermatology, that is for ailments of the skin, and also pharmacy. So they will be providing medication for, for persons who, who need it. And those drugs will be is in collaboration with our pharmacy. All of the drugs that they are bringing in is presently, the list is already with our drug inspector because this is how we bring drugs in under normal circumstances by the law. So we are ensuring that we follow all of the regulations of the country 
and so drugs will also be provided for persons who need medication and that's and free as well, also well. Free. all of the services are provided free of charge during the humanitarian mission and so just to stress that the drugs that they're bringing in in effect has already been vetted yes, so, so they're not bringing in anything that's unknown to you or something no. that may be harmful no, this collaboration, and as with all of the other collaborations at the Ministry of Health, because this is not new, we have a lot of partner agencies from the U.S., from the U.K. Um, I'm sure you're aware of Starkey that comes yes. every year. They're coming in October where they do herring health and provide um, herring aids free of charge. They've been doing it for years. We have World Pediatric Project, which deals with our children and do free surgeries. So we have been collaborating with a lot of partners from the U.S. and otherwise, and we ensure that all of the regulations are met in terms of ensuring that all of the specialists go through the licensing and registration um, process through the different councils. All of the physicians, the nurses, the allied health staff are being vetted through those councils by the law. And it's a collaborative mission. So on the boat and within the community clinics, our healthcare professionals will be working alongside the U.S. health professionals. So it won't be that persons are doing their own thing. We'll be working with them. And also it allows a level of continuity of care because anything that is done, we need to know. We're keeping track of who comes in and what is done to ensure whatever follow-up care we're able to provide within the community or the hospital afterwards. We know that certainly from the time this news broke, St. Lucians uh, were running with it. it. It was in the air. There were comments, positive and negative. And yes. we know that even while the operation is going to be going on in St. Lucia, your, your usual triage would be something that's very, very important yes. based on that sort of numbers that they're going to be dealing with. Tell us on some of, some of the provisions, how the process is actually going to start from, from the triage period up until the actual service delivery. Yes, as we do at our wellness centers, anybody coming in would have to be triaged to see what it is, what their condition is, their vital signs, all of that will be taken. And our staff will be working alongside their staff to do those initial reviews and registration of patients coming in um, on the day. And we are also going to ensure that whatever um, procedures are done, that those are well documented and persons are given referrals after they are seen. The other issue which we discussed very early is to ensure, for example, look in the case of the, the, the medication, we won't want medication coming in that is not available here. So the person would be on it for two, two months and then afterwards and then there's an issue. Get it again, yes. So it would be um, in it would be in relation to our national formulary of drugs that's available and drugs that we allow into the country. So that is why our drug inspector was on board from very early to ensure that whatever drugs, whatever medication is coming in meets the same standard of, of what, we, what we have. And what's affordable after the fact. Yes, yes, yes. So we, once the Ministry of Health is involved, we also ensure that due diligence, we ensure that everything is, is put in place because at the end of the day, we bear the responsibility. So um, we are working very closely to ensure that all of the processes um, are in place to ensure the safety of persons who are accessing care within the, the mission. Um, as if anything else in St. Lucia, there are always persons who will have doubts, will have questions, will, but um, it's, it's voluntary, so persons who are not, who don't feel comfortable, that's okay. But for persons who need care, we think it's a good um, opportunity for persons to come in and access care um, with this mission. Seems to be a lot of comfort. So we're going yes. to take yeah. a break now on the program. We'll be back before our final segment. Stay for us as we keep you in focus. We'll be back after this break. One of the eight universally recognized rights of the consumer is the right to be heard. This means that every consumer who is dissatisfied with a good or service has the right to lodge a complaint to the provider of that good or that service. This should be the first point of lodging a complaint. Ensure that the receipt as proof of the transaction is available.
climat la terre qui a changé et ça a affecté nous tous. Si le climat est plus mauvais, l'eau de l'eau est la prendre l'eau qui a détruit les animaux et les plants. Quand la mer est plus chaude, il a tué la place qui se présente dans la gravité. La mer chaude a aussi changé de manière de se présente qui a quitté l'un côté et allé à l'autre côté. Cette liste a contribué à un petit gaz en l'espace. Quand un petit pays nous a essayé de faire tout ça, nous a fait pour assurer qu'il nous baissait à ce quantité de gaz nous a servi pour empêcher la terre de venir plus chaud. Et faut pour baisser à ce quantité de gaz nous a servi, c'est la mitigation. Le climat a changé. Il a changé depuis que nous avons tout au niveau de la terre, cabouillé, gaz, l'huile et le chèque. Et ça, quand on est cause de la terre, on a changé plus chaud. Ça, nous ne pouvons faire tout le monde, c'est pour adapter. Faites tout ça, nous avons fait pour préparer et répondre pour ces conséquences négatives à la cause du changement climat. Nous tous, ça fait quelque chose. Par exemple, nous pouvons assurer qui nous protecte tout ça nous a planté. C'est vie fumier qui est naturel. Bâtir caillou pour abattre des manches en temps cyclone et godelot. Construire un canal pour de l'eau couille bien quand il faut. Et assurer qui le canal là par les ordres. Faire tout ça qui est possible pour vivre en temps de changement climat. Ça. Trouver plus d'informations à ce plan d'adaptation national gouvernement et des marches ou même ça prend pour protéger le corps et tout notre set les siens. Thanks for staying with us. We are back on air and reminding you, you can call us on 468-2162. We are open for calls in this segment and you're also live on WVENT Radio 93.5 FM and 94.7. Dr. George, just as you came to the close of your previous comments, you did mention about the, the fact we started from triage and it was also very heartening to note too that there'll be a um, close check on persons who come in and, and the follow-up meeting is quite important after the visit of the ship that there will be continued assessments and follow through on persons who actually come to the clinics yes this is very important because anybody who has a procedure done within the community they would need to be referred to our wellness center based on where the persons live to ensure they get the necessary follow-up care and also for our surgical procedures which will be done on the ship we have our teams also working on the ship with the u.s team um, referral to ensure follow-up care through our public sector clinics will also be ensured. So the, the question of records now, so even for after treatment, um, for, for follow-up visits, people will be able to get a record of whatever yes. procedures they've done? Absolutely, get a medical record they'll get a referral out. with exactly what was done and what the follow-up care should be for everybody who gets um, surgery on the ship. Now, for people who want to sim walk in, and I want to use the walk in because we'll talk about the waiting list or the national list in a moment. So, people walking in, what do they need to bring with them? The critical thing do they need to have perhaps a medical history with them? Is that important? For the clinics which we'll be having on the ground within the communities, what we advise is that if you're an elderly person, that you come in with somebody with you to provide support, so that for explanations as well, for any extra information. If you have your, and I know in the communities a lot of our patients have their little doctor's book, it would be good to bring this so the physicians could see what medication you're on, what your past history, whatever information you have on medication that you're taking or surgeries that you've had, it would be good to walk in with that. If you don't and you just come in for a checkup, that's also fine. Okay. You can just come in, you can just walk in, and then that's also. Okay. Let's go to the phone lines and say good afternoon. Thank you so much for calling you in focus with us. Go ahead. Hello? Hi. Good morning. I'm just calling to find out um, somebody who find a problem. How do I, is it possible that I see a doctor? Which doctor should I see? Okay, if you're looking to get seen on the humanitarian, at the humanitarian visit, there'll be orthopedic specialists at the clinic. So you would just need to come in any of the days from the 25th to the 30th of September, mm -hmm. and you'll be seen by the orthopedic um, specialist. 
Um, any tests after they review you, if they need to, to get tests done, you then be referred to the ship because on the ship they'll be doing diagnostics, which include CT scans, ultrasounds, x-ray, echocardiogram, laparoscopy, and also blood testing if for persons who need it. So you would just need to come in on one of those days to see the specialist at the walk-in clinic and you'll be seen. You still there, Carla? Okay, so I think that answered her question. Uh, so let's look at what's happening from the, what they call the national waiting list because we heard that a lot and a lot of people are not sure. What is that? Okay. Um, on the ship, minor surgical procedures will be done by the U.S. teams in collaboration with our surgical teams. They'll be, and for you to get surgery done on the ship, this is where we need a referral for your physician. Because as you would imagine, those procedures would need to be scheduled. So persons who are on the list or need to do any minor surgical procedures and are waiting, um, we are aware of the bed situation at Victoria Hospital. We have persons who've been waiting a while to get a procedure done. So it will also assist within that week for persons who've been waiting a while to get a procedure. Um, the procedures that are possible to be done include ophthalmology, general surgery, including hernia repair, urological um, procedures will also be available, orthopedic surgery as needed, maxillofacial surgery will also be available, minor plastic surgery, wound care will also be available. So persons who need care under some of those and other minor procedures what you would need to get from your physician is a referral note so that we can, because I would need to send that to the team from before so we can plan and schedule persons on different days for the surgery. So this is... And so that they can know what they deal right, with. Right, and we can yes. give them a time to come in. and So we need to schedule the surgeries. There's a capacity of 100 bed admission to us during the visit with 30 ICU beds as needed. So... This is where we need a referral for, for the surgery because this needs to be planned. We also need a referral for the diagnostics, like persons who've been waiting to do a CT scan and want to get one done. We just need the indication from your doctor for the, for the CT scan so that we can schedule you on a day to get it done as well. But all of the others are walk-in. You just come in with no, you don't need to come to the ministry. You don't need to call. When the clinics are open, you just walk in as needed. I would like to ask, since it's going to be that accessible, when you reach a cutoff point for a particular date, are, are the persons who are there, they, are they carried over or do you still have to come the next day and see if you can get on? Or would, would, would yes, their names well still be taken and have them scheduled? Yeah, well, we are looking at that because that's one of the things we've asked them based on their other visits, based on the numbers, because what they were indicating, if they notice their, the numbers are very big and it's getting to a certain time, then those persons will need to come in the following day. But to get in and some level of preference we, we, right. we may need to arrange to to give but we will see we'll see how it works you know to see how we because we want as many people who want to get care that they can can access the services how many of our local physicians have uh, reached out to your office to participate in this mission i'm trying to remember the numbers for the ship I can't remember the numbers. I don't want to give <laughs> an erroneous, but um, in the clinics on the ground, our district medical officers and public health nursing supervisors will, will also be there. On uh, the ship. I'm, I'm asking because, uh, you know, we have our two languages in St. Lucia, and that yes. is very important. That's um, for the visiting doctors, and they have to deal with, with our... Creole speakers. Yes, then, we've yes. taken that into consideration. So that is why a lot of our nurses will be will be there for persons who don't understand English, and we want to make sure it's very clear the communication, because a lot of the times our patients may not fully understand what is being said. So that is why we it is so important to have the the local collaboration on the ground. Now, are you confident that there will be sufficient time given to? Um, patients uh, for them you know, maybe to explain what their their ailments are because some things are not always you know mm -hmm. exposed as you know as, yes. as, as a doctor you know maybe someone can walk because they have a broken leg but there are people who need to explain how they feel they may not mm -hmm. be able to find uh, the words for them to express so how much time 
is being um, given I, to our patients? I do not know what the allotted time per patient um, is at that point. We will be having a, a further planning meeting in a couple of weeks with the U.S. team to, to see if, but I don't think it will be everybody gets a set time and then move on. I think it will be based on the needs. Some persons will clearly need to have a longer consultation time than others. It seems like this um, visit will ease a lot of pressure on our existing health facilities and care. What, 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 um, the fact that the number of your personnel will be assisting the ship, would that impact on the operations of the local facilities? Well, we, because we'll be pulling staff from some of our primary care facilities, we think that we will have less staff at some of the facilities during that week. But we are hoping that it does not affect the quality of care that we, that we give nonetheless. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but what are some of the, because we have that one clinic at OKEU, does that mean the um, other functions at OKEU would, would, would be compromised in any way or? No, okay. they'll be using a portion of OKEU that's not presently being used for the services that have moved. So it will not affect what is presently there. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the the um the dynamics of our local physicians working alongside these um well highly qualified we've been told um, people coming in the exchange of knowledge how do you see that as being something that would be beneficial for our community I think we have a lot to gain, not only during the period that they will be here, because I'm, I'm presently speaking about the services that will be available during the period, but there'll be a lot more networking um, happening. They also have teams that are involved in, in vector control, in health education. So they will be providing support not only during that period, but in terms of strengthening some of our other public health um, systems afterwards. We are looking forward to continuing the collaboration with them. All right. So that I'm sure there'll be some higher level of discussion too, maybe not just with all the physicians, the local mm -hmm. and those who are coming in, but also at levels probably like yours and, and from the ministry as well. Is there some sort yes. of contingency for that to happen? Yes, we have already started that discussion in terms of capacity building for us here on island. And um, as part of their mission, usually when they leave, they donate to where they look to see where the gaps are. And they also donate from equipment to medication or whatever we need. They would provide um, donations and support to, to, to the health sector. So we are quite pleased to, to get the opportunity this year mm -hmm. to be as part of the, the humanitarian mission, which like I said, this is their seventh mission to the region and I'm, I, I think it's a good opportunity for, for us. Can you qualify for us um, the importance to um, not just the medical community but to St. Ocean, given where we are at with our old healthcare system, we are really on the cusp of, of, of the OKEU opening, lots of work being done with St. Jude. So filling in the gap, you, you alluded to it earlier, but to really contextualize for us, for people who have been waiting for certain services for a long time, those who aren't able to afford them, you know that's mm -hmm. what a lot of people say, I can't afford to go to the doctor because I don't want to have to deal with those bills. So qualify for us. Um, the importance of that visit. But before we do that, we want to go to the phone lines and say, thank you for calling in. What's your question? Thank you. Um, I'm already studying. I'm just wondering if there's still an opportunity to be tested. She's saying she's a registered nurse. Um, we've already submitted the lists and got authorization for the persons who will be working with the surgical team on the boat, on the ship. But in terms of the community clinics, you should still contact me to see if you really want to get on. I could see how we try to facilitate that process for you. Okay. But um. we will be using, I mean, we, we will welcome um, other nurses within the, the community clinics. Uh, you want to give her that? You, do you know how to contact Dr. George? Pardon? Do you know how to make contact with her? Would okay. you like her to give that information? Yes, I'm ready. I just just sent off all my information. So I was just wanting how to do it. Okay, so okay. give her the, the number that she can contact yes. you at. Four six eight five three one zero. Just Thank call you. me and then we'll see how we try to get you in. Although it's late, but we'll see what we can do. I know. All right. Thank you so much. 
You Don't will. worry, we're putting in a good word for you. Please take her. <laughs> 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 because it's great that we have someone calling into that volunteer. I love that sort of spirit. Yes, yes absolutely. that's a very good spirit. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Oh, no, that's fine. Um, it's a very good venture, and I, I look forward to the experience, and I hope that all it comes out. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Oh, bye bye. bye, -bye. Yeah. So it sounds very young and energetic there. That's yes. why you must take her. <laughs> so we can have that transfer of knowledge happening and experience. So I was asking to, to just to um, qualify for us what, yeah. what it means for us to have that for our um, St. Lucians. Um, our health system is going through a transitioning period at that time. With what's happening with the hospitals, with us in the process of strengthening our primary care, care system. So I think... We know of some of the limitations that exist within the public sector, especially when it comes to eye care and dentistry in terms of us having the capacity to deal with a lot of the persons who need care. So I think this is an opportunity for persons who have been waiting to get their eyes checked or waiting to get some dental procedures or want another opinion, need to get some diagnostic tests done, or you've been on a waiting list because of the bed situation, you can't get on to, to do your procedure. I think it is an opportunity for us to try to get as many of those done um, now before the transition, the move, because we're in the process of moving into the, to the new hospital. So I think it's an excellent opportunity for us. Yes, I think we think so too. We're just about to close up on the program. So I'd like to get Monty to give some closing remarks and, and some general comments on what he spoke about and what his area of specialty and the, the smart um, facilities that we're setting up. And Dr. George will also give us some closing comments before you wrap up on the program. Okay, well, thanks for having me on the show. So okay. in focus. Um, for the smart health facilities, I mean, it's, it's not in all the areas as yet. We'll be coming to all the healthcare facilities. So persons may see a community getting renovated and they're saying when, when we're going to get renovated. So basically for the smart health facilities, we're trying to stay safe, green, smart. So we will get to all the facilities eventually, a little patience. Um, we're working with people from the community. We're going to be doing surveys, so we ask persons to assist us when we come to you and ask you what you think of a health facility, don't take it in the wrong context and give us the assistance that we need because you have to go, you know, and ask permission when they defer your clinic to somewhere else, don't be upset or because of the mm -hmm. renovation. Uh, we need that kind of cooperation from the public. That's a big aspect for us. Sometimes we want to close down to renovate, the public gets angry and say, well, you know, we, we, we don't have no health center, but we try to keep the time for the construction as short as possible. We're looking at three months. So cooperate with us, give us a chance for us to give you a new facility, a smart facility. So work with us, with the Ministry of Health, let us give you a better facility, better care, um, give us that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Monty Manuel, Engineer in the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And Dr. George, we really thank you for giving us such a, a, a great um, look and in detail on the visit of the U.S. Naval Ship. Your closing remarks? Um, I just want to reiterate that the the clinics and the, the services will be available from the 25th to the 30th of September. We will be providing more information as it gets closer to the time and that we urge persons who need care to take advantage of the, of the services that will be available. And we, we open to persons who have questions or queries or concerns that we continue working with the public to ensure that everything goes safely. Lisa, I know a lot of your friends must be excited about this initiative. I've heard oh, questions of ask me questions about it. I'm sure you've been getting these inquiries as well. well. And you know that I'm always loudest. I'm a big cheerleader <laughs> of anything good. So all I say is to people, the ship is coming. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. The ship is coming. I'll be there. Will you be there? Yes, for well, sure. I really like to encourage other solutions to come out and take that opportunity. So this morning we're smart and we got comfortable as well. Yes, and <laughs> I'm, um, I, I couldn't have been better today. Yes, so you're looking yes. forward to the comfort. I know that we're going to have some smart health facilities. Well, this has been in focus. I would like to thank Mr. Monty Manuel, the engineer in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and Dr. Sharon Belmar George, who is medical officer of health here in St. Lucia. We'd like to thank all of you on behalf of all of us here at the Government Information Service and National Television Network, our technical crew, our background staff and support staff. And on behalf of my co-host, Alyssa Joseph, I'm Ryan O'Brien saying goodbye for now.